Hello, and welcome to Excel 2016. My name is Sean Bugler, and I'll be your host today as we go through all of Microsoft Excel 2016. Whether you're a beginner, advanced, or you've been using this since the day you were born, Microsoft Excel has something for everybody. And as we go through these lessons, I'm sure you're going to find that there are features even you didn't know were available. Let's go ahead and get started. When you first open up Excel for the first time, this is the view you're presented with. This is called the Start Screen, and this is where we have access to any recent documents that we may have worked on in the past. Additionally, we also have access to the ability to open workbooks from other sources. Beyond that, we also have access to a template view. This template view is where we have access to blank workbooks. Additionally, in newer versions of Excel, we're also provided with a tour field. So if this is the first time you've ever opened this program and you'd like to see what new features are available, this is generally the best place to find it. Additionally, we have access to a number of templates provided by Microsoft that allow us to work with files that have been created by others. This is a really quick and easy way to start very quickly. Additionally, at the top, we can search through online templates. For instance, maybe I'd like to see a grocery list. And you'll see that not only is there more than one, there are a couple, and they look very different from each other. Oh, a monthly meal planner. That might be something I need. To get back to the templates view, if you do decide to use the search feature, we're going to use the home button. But before I do, I'd like to point out that there are a number of categories. So if you're not entirely sure what it is that you're looking for, but you'd like to narrow it down just a little bit, you can always use the category selection field as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm going to go ahead and start with a blank workbook. To select it, I'm simply going to click, and it's going to dive me right in. I know the inclination is to do a double click, but in 2016, that's not necessary. And with that, we are plopped straight into an Excel workbook. Go ahead and pause the video for just a moment here and join me in the blank workbook view. So let's talk about the structure of Excel. If you've used Excel in the past, not a lot's changed. We still have access to the ribbon. For those of you who aren't familiar with the ribbon, it's this giant part of the screen right here, often considered to be our navigation pane. This is where we have access to all of our tools and feature sets built into Excel. So within that, we have Home, Insert, Page Layout, formulas, and so on. Inside of each tab, we have access to something called command groups. These are small groupings of tools based on one of two sets of criteria. Either they manipulate similar content, or they do similar things. So either they work with some of the same subjects, or their actions are all very similar. For example, we have the clipboard, which is exclusively focused on cut, copy, and paste. Beyond that, we have access to the font command group, whose explicit purpose is to manipulate text. As we go on, you'll see me reference the command groups quite a bit. And as far as learning Excel goes, it does as well to remember these command groups are often named very intuitively. So for instance, focusing on the alignment command group, I could reasonably ascertain that we're probably going to be focusing on left align, right align, uh, and so on. This is what's going to allow us to work with the alignment of the text. Hence, the alignment command group name. Each command tab has their own series of command groups. For my 2013 users, not a lot's changed. Frankly, there's not much at all that's changed. As we go through, you might notice a few things here and there, but don't worry. If you've invested a bunch of time in learning older versions of Excel, you're going to be just fine. The next thing I'd like to talk about is something that we've seen pretty much the entire time we've worked inside of Excel, but haven't given a lot of thought to. This can be found up in the top left corner. We usually know it as just the save icon or the undo icon, because that's generally all we've used it for, but it actually has a name. This is called the Quick Access Toolbar. The Quick Access Toolbar provides us access to exactly that, a series of tools based on our needs. If you click on the drop down arrow on the right hand side of this, You'll see a list of provided tools, new, open, save, email, and so on. If you're really observant, you'll notice that these checkboxes that already exist 
directly correspond with the tools that are already available in the Quick Access Toolbar. Save to save, undo and redo, to undo and redo. So logic dictates that if I add a checkbox to a tool that doesn't have a checkbox, what'll happen? If you said it'll add it to the Quick Access Toolbar, you'd be right. If I click New, voila. A tool to create new workbooks has just been added to my Quick Access Toolbar. Now I hear what you're saying. Sean, I already know the keyboard shortcut for new. I don't need that. In fact, I don't need any of these tools. None of them really strike me as something that is imminently necessary to the point where I would need to put it up here. Well, I hear what you're saying. For my users out there who are curious to know what the keyboard shortcut for a new workbook is, by the way, it's control N. But again, I hear you. These might not necessarily be the tools that you need quick access to, but there might be a tool that you do. For example, you might notice in the font command group here, there's a blatant omission here, at least according to me. Of course, I'm talking about the strike through tool. I do a lot of collaboration in Microsoft Excel, and you might too. The strike through feature is a really useful tool. Or maybe there's another tool that you use all the time that you'd like access to. But if I click on this drop down here, I don't see access to strike through. But I do see more commands. If you notice on the right hand side of more commands, you'll see that there's an ellipses. That dot dot dot. That dot 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 simply means that there's more behind the scenes. There's a dialog window. So I'm going to go ahead and click on more commands here. And I gain access to a series of tools. And on the right hand side, I have my tools that are inside the quick access toolbar. My save, my undo, my redo, and so on. Now I think we can all agree that we don't need new file. So to get rid of that, I'm going to highlight it and either use the remove tool or double click. Either way, we'll remove it from your quick access toolbar. Go ahead and pause the video and let's get to this point here. Once again, to remind you how we got here, we were inside the Excel blank workbook and we navigated up to the drop down arrow on the right hand side of the quick access toolbar. Having clicked on that, we navigated down to more commands. Go ahead and do that now and join me after the break. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to find a tool to add to my quick access toolbar. So we'll go ahead and stick with the example I gave previously. I'd like to find strike through and add it to my quick access toolbar. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here. It seems like it's alphabetized, so this should be pretty easy. And I get down to the bottom here. I've got my save, save as, set print, shapes. But no strike through. Well, what gives? I thought this instructor knew what he was talking about. Did you figure it out? If you said it's because we're inside the popular commands drop down here, you'd be absolutely right. Despite my objections, Microsoft doesn't agree that strike through is considered a popular command. And in fact, there are a lot of tools that don't meet the criteria for being considered a popular command. One of them might also be the tool that you're thinking of that you'd like to use. So to fix that, we're going to click on this drop down arrow here. And we're going to go to all commands. This is a list of every single tool inside of Microsoft Excel. And there are a lot. How many you ask? Not a clue. A lot. In fact, most of them you'll never use, and that's okay. Because this is about finding the tools we do use. In fact, we're finding the tools that we use a lot. So let's go ahead and find that strike through tool. Now this scrolling is taking a long time here, so I'm actually just going to click inside this list and press the S key. Now at this stage right here, you can't type out the full name of the tool. I know that would be nice. Unfortunately, that functionality has just not been added yet. But it does take me at least to the S section. And I'm looking and I'm looking and strike through. Go ahead and find strike through from the all commands list. And I'd like to add it to my quick access toolbar now. So either by highlighting it and clicking the add button on the right hand side here, or by double clicking on it, let's go ahead and add it to the quick access toolbar. A common question that I often get asked is, let's say I do set all this up. Is it going to be available in all of my workbooks or just this one? And the answer is, it's going to work in all of them. For as long as you have this version of Excel, 
and you're on your computer, these tools will be available to you. If you'd like to reset it at any point, let's say you add 40 tools, you can always click on the reset button on the bottom right here and select either reset only quick access toolbar or for those of you who go crazy with it and decide to customize the ribbon as well, we can reset all customizations. Now I'm not going to do that because I want strike through, but know that that's available for you. Once you've found all the tools you'd like to add to your quick access toolbar, go ahead and click OK. And just like that, I have access to strike through. How easy was that? Go ahead and pause the video and get to where I am. Once again, to reiterate, in order to customize the quick access toolbar, we clicked on the drop down arrow right here. We selected more commands. We found the tool, and if it's not inside the popular commands drop down, we now know we can change that to all commands. From there, we find the tool in this giant list of ours and either highlight it and select the add button or double click to see it added to our quick access toolbar. And lastly, we click OK to lock it in. Go ahead and pause the video and do that now. All right, so we've customized the quick access toolbar. It feels good to make the program a little bit more ours, doesn't it? In fact, Microsoft provides a lot of tools that allow us to customize different parts of the Microsoft Excel interface. And we'll talk a little bit more so about those in just a little bit. But before I do, I'd like to dive into how we can make changes to the file. Up until now, we've been referencing tabs that are to the right of the Home tab. These are tabs where we can make changes within the file. However, there's one tab out of all of these that is slightly unlike the other. In this case, I'm talking about File. Go ahead and find the File tab, and let's click inside of it. And with a swoopy animation, we dive into what we like to call the Backstage View. This is where we can make changes about the file. All other tabs inside of Excel make changes inside the file, but this is where we can see the grand scheme of things, if you will. At the very top, we have access to Info, where we can protect our workbook, inspect our workbook, manage our workbook, and even view options. As we go throughout the lessons inside of Excel, we'll talk a little bit about more of these. Inside the new view here, we see exactly the same view we saw inside of our start screen, our templates. Of course, we can always select our blank workbook, and yet again we have access to our search bar so we can search for online templates. The Open tab does exactly that. It opens any workbooks that we may have available to us. And in 2016, it's easier than ever to open from online storage solutions. In this case, I have several OneDrive accounts connected, as well as a SharePoint site, for those of you who operate inside SharePoint environments. Additionally, I also have access to files on my PC. And if I'm not sure, and I would just like to get to a more familiar view, I can always click Browse, and that'll bring up my open view. Additionally, I have access to Save and Save As. However, because I've not saved this file yet at all, I can't use the Save button. For those of you who aren't sure what the difference is, Save As creates a new copy of a file that you may have already saved before. Save, on the other hand, only works if a file has already been saved and already has a place that you can save it to. If you've never defined a save point, Save won't work, and it'll force you into the Save As view, as you can see by my clicks here. No matter how many times I click on Save, it forces me into the Save As view. Print brings us down into our Print Preview field where we can make a number of changes before we select the final print. Inside of Share, we have the ability to work with a number of different features here, and this is kind of cool. We've actually seen some expanded options. We now have access to something called the Share with People. Now, there's another place that we're going to have access to this, but I'd like to point out here that before we can do anything, we have to save our document to a OneDrive location. Once we've done that, we'll be able to do just that, share with people. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Within email, we can send as an attachment. For those of you who have Outlook set up or another default file email solution, clicking this button will open up Outlook, open up a Compose email, 
and attach that file all in one click. And that feels pretty good. We additionally have the ability to send as a PDF or XPS file. Additionally, we're seeing a resurgence in the Present Online feature. This allows us to present this program in a Skype meeting or conversation. For those of you who are working in environments that are going to be engaging in Skype for Business, this is going to be a really powerful tool. And lastly, we have Send by Instant Message. So, for all of you who work in corporate environments, if you've got Skype for Business already interacted, you can actually save this via Skype for Business, or for those of you who are more familiar with the older version of this link, to anyone on our network. Everyone gets a copy, and everyone gets an instant message. Underneath Share, we have Export. This allows us to either create it as a PDF or XPS file, or change the file type to a number of different options found here on the right. Where else do we have access to this? Well, funny you should ask, there it is right there. These are all things that we can do inside the Save As dialog box as well. Underneath Export we have Publish, which is exclusively focused on Power BI, something that has newly been implemented out of the box inside of Excel 2016. Underneath Publish we have Close, which will do exactly that. Don't click on this just yet. Underneath that we have Account, where you can see information about the account here. And interestingly enough, we can also change the theme here. Now, what does that mean to change the theme? Well, I'll show you. This isn't the best view to do it, but I will show you shortly. You can also see any connected services that might have been placed here. Lastly, let's talk options. Go ahead and find options on the very bottom here and click on it. This is where we can change a lot of deep down features inside of Excel. Things from the default file font to where these files get saved. But this is also where we can change the office theme. And this is where we come back to the ability to customize this program to our liking. In Excel 2016, and in fact all of Office 2016, we see that these programs have gotten a new colorful option. Now this theme is being provided across all of those programs, but we do have the ability to change that. Currently we find here in the Office theme that we can change it from colorful to maybe a more familiar view. If I select the white Office theme and click OK, all of my Excel 2013 users are going to breathe a sigh of relief because this is a much more familiar view. The file tab now has its distinguished coloration, the remaining tabs do not. Additionally, we've been provided one more theme because two wasn't enough. We have the dark gray theme. And this one is brand new to Microsoft Excel and all of the Office productivity programs. This provides a dark user interface for the very first time and it's getting rave reviews from users who prefer a dark user interface, whether because the white is too bright or because they need something that's a little bit more calming to the eyes. The dark user interface is a really cool feature that's been built in new to Office 2016. Personally, I prefer the colorful theme, so I'm going to stick with that for the duration of this presentation, but do know that you have these options available. Go ahead and play around with those options here for just a moment, and let's join us back after the break. Once again, to get into that view, we jumped into the file, options, and within options, we had access to the office theme. We also had access to the office theme inside the file account, where we can change the office theme here as well. So however you'd like to do it, go ahead and try that and come back after that. So now that we've seen a little bit about what's new inside of Excel, let's talk about some things that have stayed the same. On the top left hand side, we have access to our cell map field here. This tells us where our active cell is. So for instance, currently it's in cell A1, an amalgamation of the column value A and the row value 1, A1. However, if I place my cursor anywhere else, I can see exactly where that is without having to make that juxtaposition of D and 9 in this case. I can simply look up here in the top left corner and see that I am currently inside cell D9. 
Beyond that, on the right-hand side, I have the formula bar. The formula bar is where I can manipulate things going on inside of that cell. Additionally, I also have access to my insert functions tool, which we'll talk about in a little bit. On the right hand side, we have access to our trusty scroll bar. This is where we can scroll up and down, and if you'd like to, additionally, right and left, using these scroll bars found to the right and on the bottom. Simply by clicking and holding the scroll bar, we can do that, sliding to the left and right using the bottom scroll bar, or up and down using the right scroll bar. Additionally, I can use these arrows to expand or contract my view in the upward or downward direction or the right and left direction as necessary. As with all Microsoft programs in the top right hand corner, I have access to my trusty three here, minimize, maximize or restore depending on the view you're in, and quit. Additionally to the left we have a new button here, the ability to collapse our ribbon view. So for instance if you're working on a screen that is less than the size you'd like it to be and you need more working space, you can select the display ribbon options and auto hide the ribbon. This completely removes the ribbon from view and when we need it we click on that ellipses that pops up at the top and we gain access to it again. Once again if you're in this view Simply find the ellipses and give it a click and it will reveal itself to you. However, to lock it in, you're going to need to select that same tool again and deselect by selecting the show tab and commands. Go ahead and take an opportunity to play with those features for just a moment and come back to me. Now, no matter what version of Excel you're coming from, there are two things for sure that you had to have noticed that are very different from any other version of Excel ever. And we'll talk about both of them, but let's go ahead and start with this one right here, because we've already seen an example of where this tool also exists in other parts of this program. This is called the Share button. The Share button allows us to do just that, share the workbook we're in to encourage collaboration or to submit a final product. Go ahead and click on the Share tool, and you'll see that the first thing it asks us to do is save a copy of our file to an online location and it provides us with a button to do just that, save to the cloud. In order to use this tool, you do need to save to the cloud. So I'll go ahead and do just that. I'm going to click on save to the cloud here, and it's going to ask me where I'd like to save it. And of course it provides my save as menu, which we've seen already. I'm going to go ahead and save it to my OneDrive account. And maybe I'll go ahead and call this Excel 2016 Training and I'll go ahead and click Save. And there it is. And just like that, I've saved it to the cloud. Once I've saved it to the cloud, I'm provided with new share options. I can invite people, and depending on what it is that I'm asking for, I can control how they have access to this file. So depending on who it is, I can ask them to view the file and edit it, or maybe I'd only like them to view it and give me their thoughts in a separate medium. I don't necessarily want them to have access to my functions and formulas or any of my raw data to mess up or accidentally delete. Lastly, I can create a message asking them for either general assistance or maybe more specific things. At the very bottom here, we have access to anybody who has already been shared this file. Currently, I'm the only one, and you can see, as denoted by the owner tag, that I'm the only person that has access to this because I'm the one that created it. Once you've invited somebody, you simply click the Share button, and once they've accepted it, you'll be able to see their name populate on the list down here below. I'll go ahead and close that. Now, we've almost come to a close on our tour of the interface of Microsoft Excel 2016, but there's one part of the ribbon left that we haven't talked about yet, and it's the biggest one. In fact, it's the biggest change to ever come to the Microsoft Office ribbon since the introduction of the ribbon. It's called the Tell Me Bar, and it's indicated by a light bulb followed by the phrasing, Tell Me What You Want To Do. 
Now, I know that sounds a little vague and a little too open, but that's because this tool is so powerful that that's all it needs is for you to talk to it. For instance, let's say I don't remember how to insert a column. So in this field right here, I'm just going to go ahead and click inside and say, how do I insert a column? And check it out. The tool that pops to the top of the list is the insert tool. And it's not just what that tool is. Oh, lost it there. But if I hover over it, check it out. I can either insert individual cells, I can insert rows, or there it is. Insert entire columns or sheets. If I give it a click, it doesn't just show me where it is. It actually inserted an entirely new column for me. This is a game-changing feature because there are so many tools inside of Microsoft Excel. There's no way you're going to remember where all of them are. And for the times where you don't remember, you don't have to Google it anymore. You don't have to Bing it if that's your thing too. All you have to do is go to the Tell Me bar and say, hey, how do I add comments? And there it is, the insert comment feature. The Tell Me feature is a huge introduction into navigating this increasingly complex program. And while Microsoft has made huge strides in terms of making this a more usable program, not everybody is going to remember where everything is. And that's okay, and in fact, it's easier than ever to not remember with a tool like this. Go ahead and take a moment to try it out for yourself, the Tell Me Bar. It's a huge introduction into Microsoft Excel navigation, and it could potentially change the way you interact with this program entirely. All right. So while we're on the topic of new features being introduced into Excel 2016, let's not stop there. I've got one more amazing feature I'd like to show you. Even cooler than, potentially, the Tell Me Bar. Inside this worksheet right here, I've got access to three cells with some content in it I might not understand. For instance, why oh why? Now why oh why would I put that inside of a worksheet? Well, why oh why would anybody? Well, it's because it means something to some people. And you might not be entirely sure what it means either. Now where do you turn if you don't understand something? Well, in 2015, most of us Google it. However, with the introduction of this new feature that I'm about to tell you about, Excel doesn't need you to jump out of the program in order to look it up. Go ahead and find a cell, or in this case, in your worksheet, type the words YOY, or the letters. Once you've done that, go ahead and give it a right click, and there's a new tool that's been introduced into the right click submenu. It's called Smart Lookup. So having highlighted that cell, find the Smart Lookup tool and click on it. And we get a new pane called the Insights pane to pop up here. And just like that, it's identified what this potentially could mean. In this case here, YOY may refer to the YOI language. However, more than likely inside of a spreadsheet, that's not the case. And as we go a little bit further, we see that it's potentially an abbreviation for year over year, which is an easier way of identifying how we compare last year's performance to this year's performance. The Insights pane provides us with not only definitions, but it'll do a web search to provide top links. Here we go here, Investopedia. So now we get a full breakdown of what exactly YOY is, if this is exactly what we're looking for, and it is. Let's try another tool. I'm going to go ahead and right click on FY here, and I'm going to try a smart lookup again. Now in this case here, my first two options, the FY postcode area and Feng Yun, aren't necessarily exactly what I'm looking for, so let's scroll down a little bit further and see if we can find some relevant context. And there it is right there. The very top web search, a fiscal year, so now I can see that some of these are finance terms. Let's try one more. Satya Nadella. Now a lot of people have heard this name but may not necessarily know where they've heard it from. Once again, this time, actually, instead of doing my right click and smart lookup, I'm going to go ahead and navigate up to the Tell Me Bar. Now I know that the Tell Me Bar can tell me where these tools are that are available to me, but what happens if I type something that isn't a tool, maybe something I'd like to search? 
Once it's identified that I'm typing something that isn't a tool, it's either going to provide me help or offer to do a smart lookup on it. So I'm going to do that. And there it is. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. It's provided his Wikipedia. It's also provided a Bing image search. If there was any doubt about what the web engine backing all of this was, search no further. Of course it's provided by Bing. This is Microsoft finally stretching its muscles a little bit in terms of the experience and data that it's collected with its Bing search engine over the years. So there you have it. Once again, to use the Smart Lookup feature, simply find a cell, right-click on it, and select Smart Lookup, or from the Tell Me bar, simply type what it is you're not sure of, in our case, Satya Nadella, and select Smart Lookup from the drop-down menu. Go ahead and pause the video to check that new feature out. There's a couple of other fundamentals within the Excel interface that we should talk about before we move any further. The first one is really important. On the top left hand side, you'll see that we have A1 listed in this little box here. Now this isn't a cell, this is actually telling us what cell our current active selection is. You'll notice that I currently have A1 selected. This is the name box. The name box tells us exactly where our current active selection cell is. So let's say I click into cell C3. You'll notice that now it's changed to C3. This is to allow us to know exactly what cell we have selected, no matter where we are in the spreadsheet. While it's relatively easy when we're talking about A1 or C3, when we get a little bit farther out, like for instance here in C P14, it's a little bit more tedious to have to go all the way to the left to see that we're in row 14, and then all the way up to the top to see that we're in the column P. So using the name box makes a big difference. As we get a little bit further, you'll also see when we have certain fields selected, if they're named ranges or tables, the named box will tell us the names of those fields as well. To the right of that, we have access to the formula bar. The formula bar not only tells us what formulas are happening behind the scenes within a cell, but it'll also just tell us what's inside the cell. So for example here, if in cell A2, I just type the number 2, the formula bar tells me that that's exactly what's going on inside the cell. However, if inside the cell I have 1 plus 1, you'll see that while the cell itself does say 2, when I select it, the formula bar actually tells me what's really happening behind the scenes. It's calculating 1 plus 1. So the formula bar allows us to see behind the looking glass, if you will, to allow us to understand better what's going on inside of our spreadsheets. This is also where we can make changes to the cell. So instead of double clicking on the cell to make changes, we can click inside the formula bar. And let's say that I'd like this formula to be 1 plus 2. Once I hit enter there, you'll see that the cell itself changes as well. The formula bar allows us to make widespread changes without having to bury ourselves within the actual cell spreadsheet. This kind of keeps us a little bit more focused on the formula and not the content happening around the cell. On the very bottom of our sheet, we have our status bar. Our status bar, of course, has existed since 2007. This tells us whether or not we are in the middle of using a tool or whether or not there are instructions that we need to be made aware of. Currently, Excel is ready to go. If you right click on the status bar, you can add additional features here. For example, maybe I'd like to see whether or not I can flash fill. Or maybe I'd like to see whether or not signatures are available in a particular field. This allows me to make a number of different changes without having to think too hard about where to go. On the bottom right hand side, we have access to our view fields. So I can change between my standard view. I can change to my print preview view. I can change to a number of different setups within that. To the right of that, I have my zoom feature here, where I can use my minus or my plus sign to increase or decrease my zoom level of the spreadsheet. Now here's a fun little trick within that. If you press and hold the control key and use the scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out using that feature set as well. In fact, that's generally my preferred method of zooming in and out. And lastly, on the right hand side, we have our scroll bars. Now, of course, our scroll bars allow us to do exactly that, scroll throughout the spreadsheet, either by clicking and holding the scroll bar, 
and dragging up and down. However, you'll notice that it only lets me go down to row 21. However, if I use that downward arrow to keep clicking, it'll take me even further. Additionally, the same methodology applies to my down scroll bar here, allowing me to scroll from left to right. However, once again, you'll see that it only lets me go as far as column R, unless I use my arrows, in which case it allows me to go even further. So there you have it. Go ahead and take this opportunity to try that out and explore the interface a little bit more so before we carry on. There's a lot of different ways to navigate within Microsoft Excel. Of course, we've always been able to point and click to get to the cell we'd like to go to, but it's not always the most precise methodology to do just that. Alternatively, we've always also been able to use the arrow keys. So let's say I'd like to go down a cell. Simply tapping on the down arrow key allows me to do just that. Tapping on the right arrow key allows me to go to one cell to the right. Tapping on the up arrow key allows me to go one cell up. And the left arrow key allows me to jump to the cell to my left. Now, one cell at a time may not necessarily be your cup of tea. For example, maybe you'd like something a bit more extreme that allows you to jump to the furthest reaches of a data set. Do you happen to know how many rows are inside of Microsoft Excel? Well, you can find out. By pressing and holding the control key, and then tapping the down arrow, you'll see it flings us all the way to the furthest reaches of Microsoft Excel. In this case, we see that the furthest row possible inside of this program is row 1,048,576. Tapping on the home key, or in this case, control home key, allows me to go back to the original cell that I was in. Were you curious to see how many columns are inside of Microsoft Excel? Well, we saw that the right arrow key by itself only takes us one cell to one cell. But pressing and holding the modifier key, the control key, and then tapping the right arrow key flings us all the way to column value XFD. That's pretty far out. Hopefully that's enough cells for you. Once again, I'm going to press and hold the control key and tap the home key, and this is going to bring me back to cell A1. So a couple of different ways to navigate within the spreadsheet. Additionally, we're able to select cells in a number of different ways, either using the mouse by clicking and dragging. But again, this might not necessarily be the most precise methodology. We saw that pressing and holding the control key enhanced our arrow keys. What about the shift key? Well, if you press and hold the shift key and use the arrow keys, you'll see that I'm able to select multiple fields of cells. Now I'm tapping the down arrow key in this instance. And once I've done that, let's say it all the way down to row 10, let's say I'd like to expand outward to column F. So I'll tap my right arrow key twice, and you'll see that it selects the values as necessary. All really quick and easy ways to navigate throughout the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Go ahead and pause the video and try that for yourself. We're starting to see that Pressing and combining keys allows us to enhance the feature sets of our keyboard. These are called keyboard shortcuts, and they're really popular among power users and the average everyday users alike. Let's talk about a couple of other ones that we have available to us. For example, let's say I'd like a new workbook. Well, I could go to the File tab and select New, and then pick the template from there. However, that's a lot of steps, when all I really need is a blank workbook. By pressing and holding the control key and tapping the N key, you'll see that it's jumped me into a brand new Excel workbook. I'm now in the generic workbook, book two. Let's say I'd like to open up a file that I already have saved somewhere. Well, if control N for new creates a new workbook, any guesses what the keyboard shortcut for open would be? If you're saying to yourself control O, you'd be absolutely right. Once again, by pressing the modifier key control and tapping the O key, you'll see it flings us into the open dialog. This is where I have access to any recent files I might have been working in, any online cloud drives I might have access to, or any files I have on my PC. So if control N for new creates a new workbook and control O opens up a new workbook, any guesses what save is? If you said control S, you'd be absolutely right once again. Good guesses. By pressing and holding the control key and tapping the S key, 
you'll see it flings me into, well, this is interesting, the Save As dialog box. In case you missed out on the, when I mentioned it earlier, when you haven't saved a file before, it forces you into the Save As dialog box. So let's say that I'd like to save as now. I'm going to go ahead and create a location because, of course, save can't create a file, only save as can. So I'm going to go ahead and save mine to the desktop and call this practice save. So now that I've saved my file, I'll try my keyboard shortcut control S again and nothing happens, at least not as far as I can tell. But it is actually saving my file. We just can't see it now because save is doing its job. It's just overwriting the existing file. Now with that being said, what's the keyboard shortcut for save as? What if I don't want to overwrite my existing file? I'd like to save it as a new copy. Well, in this case here, up until now, we've been served some softballs with these keyboard shortcuts. Control N is new. Control O is open. Control S is save. So what's save as? It's not control SA, it's actually just the F12 key. So if you tap the F12 key, it'll jump you straight into the save as dialog box. This is also where we can save this document as any type of file that Excel is capable ex of exporting into. Here in the save as type, you'll see that it's currently saving it as an Excel workbook. If I click on that, you can see all the different types of documents that I'm able to save this Excel spreadsheet as. I can save it as a workbook. For my power users, I can save it as a macro-enabled workbook. For those of you who work with organizations or divisions that might have older versions of Microsoft Excel, they can't read the newer versions of Microsoft Excel workbooks. Anything from 2007 on can't be read by a Excel 2003 or earlier version of Excel. So in those instances, we might actually need to save it as Excel 97 to 2003, or the .xls document workbook. We can save it as a web page. When we get a little bit farther into these lessons, you'll see that we have the ability to save these documents as templates. Now there's a lot of other options within that here, and of course I encourage you to explore the ones that make the most sense to you. One that of course I'd be remiss to not point out would be the PDF and XPS file formats allowing us to save these documents in the PDF file styling. So we see that we have a lot of different ways that we can export this workbook. In this case here, I'm going to go ahead and leave it alone. Go ahead and take this opportunity to practice a couple of those keyboard shortcuts. We'll be introducing them as we go along throughout this lesson, but it's important to note that quite a few of these file tools do have keyboard shortcuts. In case you're ever not sure if a tool does or does not have a keyboard shortcut, if it's inside the ribbon here, for instance bold, just go ahead and hover over it, and you'll see that bold, immediately to the right of that, has control B in parentheses. This allows us to see that it has a keyboard shortcut. So if I try the control B keyboard shortcut, it would bold the text that I have selected. Many tools have keyboard shortcuts, so I do encourage you to just highlight some of these. For instance, fill color does not. However, making text bigger, oh, in this case, does not as well. There's one, control U for underline. Go ahead and pause the video for just a moment and try some of these keyboard shortcuts out and maybe try to see if your favorite tool has a keyboard shortcut all on its own. All right, welcome back. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the basic user interface of Microsoft Excel. And you might have seen that up until this point, we haven't done a lot of typing inside of the actual spreadsheet. Well, that stops now. What I'd like to do is focus a little bit more so on actually putting this content inside the spreadsheet. Let's say that we've decided to strike it out on our own. We're going to be opening up an artisanal coffee shop. I live here in San Francisco, and if there's one thing this city totally needs another one of, it's an artisanal coffee shop. We'll go ahead and start with the actual name of our business. I'm here in cell A1, and I'd like to just put the name of the business in here. Now, I can't think of a better artisanal coffee shop name than the one on the tip of my tongue here, Birch and Sons. Actually, it's 2015. Birch and Daughters, there we go. So I've got my Birch and Daughters coffee shop. Now, when I finished typing, I tapped the enter key, and you might have seen that my cell jumped down to A2. 
The reason being is that the enter key is actually the equivalent of a down arrow key, especially when you're inside of a cell. Now with that being said, you can also go to the right instead by tapping the tab key. So by tapping the tab key, you can finish typing content inside of a cell and go one cell to the right, or again, the enter key to go down. Now within that, you can also go one cell up by pressing and holding the shift and then tapping the enter key. So if the tab key pushes us off to the right and the enter key pushes us down, but the shift enter key brings us back up, what do you think shift tab will do? Well, if you said it's gonna bring us to the left, you'd be absolutely right. So once again, the enter key brings us down a cell, the tab key brings us to the right, the shift tab key brings us back to the left, and the shift enter key brings us one cell up. Now let's say that I'm not done with this name here. Let's say that Birch and Daughters isn't the full name. Maybe I'd like to add the word coffee shop to that. If you saw the name Birch and Daughters, you might be curious as to what kind of business that would be too. So if I'd like to add new content into the cell without double clicking on it, or going up to the formula bar, both of which are things I could do, I'm gonna simply tap the F2 key, and the F2 key is going to bring me back into that cell at the very end. You'll see that my cursor is now active, and I can go ahead and add the rest of my content. And I'll go ahead and type space, coffee shop. Now, if I'm done typing inside of a cell, but I don't want it to drop down or go to the right or go up or to the left, I can press and hold the control key and tap the enter key, and it will keep my active cell inside the content without having to jump down or go to the right. So again, if you don't want your cursor to move, but you're done editing the cell, press and hold the control key and tap the enter key. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point with me. All right, so let's go ahead and expand on this menu a little bit more so. We need to know what kind of items we're gonna be carrying here. So I'm gonna go ahead and type items in cell A3. I'd like to drop down, so I'm gonna tap my enter key. And I definitely know that a coffee shop probably is gonna carry coffee. Probably gonna carry tea. And then maybe a couple of food items. We'll say bagels, crumpets. For all of my tea drinkers out there, I know you're about your crumpets. And additionally, I'd like to go ahead and enumerate the price here. So how much is our coffee gonna cost? Well, this is an artisanal coffee shop, so we're probably talking, let's say $4. So I'm gonna go ahead and type 4.00, and I'm gonna hit enter. Huh, where did my .00 go? Well, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but I do wanna point out that despite the fact that I did type 4.00, that went away. Let's talk about tea. How much is our tea gonna cost? Let's go ahead and say 350. Once again, I'm gonna go ahead and type 3.50, and I'm gonna hit enter, and, huh, now wait a minute. I definitely typed a zero right after that five, and I know I typed two zeros after that four. So what's going on here? Well, the problem is, Excel is trying to keep these cells as simple as possible. And one of the ways it does that is by removing zeros that might go on forever. For those of us that remember algebra, you might have been taught that every number has zeros after it. 4.00000000 is still just the number 4. And in fact, all numbers have that decimal-based valuing after it. In order to make sure that this is the simplest presentation of these numbers, Excel actually removes those zeros. To fix that, we have to change the number formatting. We actually have to tell Excel what kind of number this is. So there's a couple of different ways we can do that here. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and select that four, and I'm gonna right click on it. Now, where can I format the settings for this? Uh, there, format cells. I'm gonna go ahead and click on format cells, and it jumps me into the number formatting settings. So what kind of number is this gonna be? Is this gonna be a regular number? Maybe. Or is it gonna be currency? Notice it actually affixes the dollar signs to it. This is exactly what I want, so I'm gonna go ahead and apply my currency and click OK. Much better. Now I've got my .00 afterwards, but I still don't have it here. 
The reason being is that I only made that change to that one cell. We have a saying at Learnit, and it's that you've got to select to effect. If I want to make changes to a certain cell, I need to select it first. So I'm going to go ahead and select the three additional cells that I know I'm going to be typing dollar values into. And this time I'm going to show you an even faster way. I'm going to select those three cells and inside the home tab, I'd like to draw your attention to the number formatting command group here. Currently the formatting is set to general. So I'm going to go ahead and change that by clicking on the drop down arrow and selecting the currency number formatting. And there we go. So I've now changed the way Excel presents this information. So I'll go ahead and fill out the rest of this here. We'll say the bagels are going to be 250 and the crumpets will be 275. Go ahead and take this opportunity to pause the video and catch up with me here. Once again, to change the number formatting, simply select a cell and right click on it and go to format cells and choose the formatting category from there or alternatively, select the cell and then using the number formatting command group, click from the drop down and select from there as well. Go ahead and try that for yourselves. All right, welcome back. So hopefully now you're all caught up with me here. We have our Birch and Daughters coffee shop and we're building a menu. Now, over the break, I ran this menu by a focus group. It was expensive, but it was totally worth it because we've seen that the focus group told us crumpets are definitely out. The average person doesn't go to a coffee shop to order crumpets. So I'd like to remove that item from the menu and replace it with something a little bit more modern. So in this instance here, I'm going to go ahead and remove the word crumpets from cell A7. There's a couple of different ways I can do that for you, and I'm going to run that back. The first way I can do it is simply by pressing the delete key. So I'm going to highlight A7 and press the delete key, and you'll see that it's deleted the entire value instantaneously. So that's one way to do it. I'm going to go ahead and undo that so I can show you another way. To undo, you can either use the undo button on the top left corner, or alternatively, you can press and hold the control key and tap the letter Z. Either way will work. So once again, you can either press the backspace key or the delete key to delete a value, or let's say that I just like to replace the value. Maybe crumpets aren't going to do so well, but biscuits a more common iteration of crumpets, might be, or English muffins, let's do English muffins. So to replace crumpets, I'm simply going to start typing. I've got A7 selected and I'm just gonna start typing there, English muffins. And once I'm done, I'd like to get out of the editing field here, but I don't wanna leave the cell. To do that, I'm gonna press and hold the control key and tap the enter key once again, and there you go. English muffins is now in the cell. Now, wait a minute here. Where's the word muffin? What's an English M? I don't know. What's happened here? Did I just lose all of my content? Well, the answer is complicated, but we'll break it down here. When we start to type anything inside of a cell, we're allotted a certain amount of space here. In this case here, you can see that the space between A and B is not that large. So you can see that English muffin didn't fit in all the way. But you might be saying to yourself, Sean, we typed Birch and Daughters in here and it seems to fit fine. Well, it kind of does. The reason being is that English M, or in this case English muffins, is being cut off because cell B7 does have a value in it. Meanwhile, A1 is allowed to run on and on and on because there's no values in B1 or C1. If I typed anything inside of these cells right here, like the word hello, You'll see that Birch and Daughter's coffee shop immediately got hidden because B1 takes precedence. However, if I delete the value, A1 is allowed to run itself over simply because there is no content it could possibly be impeding on. So how do we fix this? Well, we need to resize the column. The easiest way to do that is to find the border between A and B or in between any column that has a value you'd like to adjust and clicking and holding I'm going to expand the value until muffins fully fits in. Additionally, what I could have also done is find the border and double click. Now you'll notice it went a lot farther and this is because of Birch and Daughter's coffee shop field here. It auto expanded to the widest value inside of that column. So depending on the way that you're trying to expand it, 
This might not necessarily be the way that you want. I think this is a little far, personally. So I'm going to readjust so that it allows English muffins to show without being too big. Of course, we can also do the same thing with row-based values. We can make row-based values wider as well. Or more narrow. Once again, by finding the border between any two rows, you can double-click, and it will auto-fit based on the content of the cells in the rows. Go ahead and pause the video and try that for yourself. All right, so we've had some opportunities to enter content and edit content if we need to. Now, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about what we can do with this data once it's input. Now, I've gone ahead and I've added data for weeks one through four in terms of total unit sales for coffee, tea, bagels, and English muffins. So this is great. Our business is successful. We're making it but we don't know exactly what's going on with all of this data. At this stage, all we know is how much we sold in any one week for any one of these particular items. There's not a lot of questions we can answer with this data just yet. For example, maybe I'd like to know the total amount of units I sold in week one completely. This might give me a better idea of how many customers I might have had or how many individual transactions I might have had. So let's say I would like to calculate the total unit sales for week one. Placing my cursor cell in cell C8 here, what I'd like to do is calculate all of the values directly above. Now, for those of you who have used Excel in the past, I'm sure you know the ability to type equals and add up all of these different values. But before we get to all of the hand typing, I'd like to show you some automated options that we have available to us. In particular, I'd like to introduce to you the auto sum tool. So go ahead and let's place our cursor in cell C8 and I'm going to go ahead and just click the auto sum button. When I do, it actually does exactly that. It auto sums up the values directly above it. It's made a guess as far as what the values I'd like to add together are. In this case, it's identified cell C4, 5, 6, and 7 as those values. And it's saying, hey, do you want to sum those up? It's guessed right, so I'm just going to go ahead and tap the enter key. And you can see that I sold in week one, 1,625 units. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for weeks two through four. Once again, I'm gonna place my cursor in cell D8 and click the auto sum tool. It's gonna to select all of the values that I think it's going to be adding together. But if I'd like to edit it, I can always just highlight the content myself. Now in this case, it's right, but let's say it's wrong. Let's say it only guessed that one cell. I can click and drag and fix it. Now once I'm done here, I could tap the enter key again, but I'd like to get just to the next cell to my right. Who remembers the key that I used to go one cell to the right? If you guessed the tab key, you'd be absolutely right. I'm gonna go ahead and tap the tab key, and it's gonna take me right over. You can see week two was definitely better than week one. Go ahead and take this opportunity to apply auto sum to weeks three and four. All right, so, so far we've calculated the total unit sales for weeks one, two, three, and four using the auto sum feature. What I'd like to do now is find out the total amount of coffee that I sold in this particular month. To do that, I'm gonna place my cursor in cell G4. And in the same process here, what I could do is use the auto sum feature. And the auto sum feature prevents me from having to go through the tedious process of typing an equal sign typing the word sum with an open parenthesis and then saying C4 plus D4 plus E4 plus. You can see how this is really tedious even just to watch me do that. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and use the auto sum tool, but this time before I click enter, I'd like to point out that it's not perfect. Notice that it actually includes the pricing value in column B which is not exactly what I wanted. In this case, I only want weeks one through four, or in this case, C through F. So I'm gonna reselect from C4 to F4, and I'm gonna be dropping down to the cell below, so I'm gonna tap the Enter key, and there you go. So go ahead and do that. Auto sum for all these individual values here. Once again, Simply click the auto sum tool and highlight the values that you would like summed together. 
Now, lastly, what I'd like to do is get a total units sold overall. Now, which one do I calculate? Do I calculate the values above or the values to my left? Well, the answer is the same, no matter which one you use, because this one is simply calculating individual weeks, whereas these values are calculating individual items. However, the total units sold will be the same regardless. So overall, we sold 6,879 units in a single month. That's not bad. Go ahead and pause the video and take this opportunity to catch up with me. All right, welcome back. So we've calculated the total units sold per week and per item, and we were able to do that using automated features like the AutoSum tool. What we'd like to do now is focus a little bit more on the real world matters. We'd like to figure out now that we've got our total units sold, how much did we make? Let's talk dollars for a moment here, ladies and gentlemen. Here in cell H4, I've got a column ready to calculate my subtotals. Now, how do I calculate how much money I actually made? Well, with this data here, I can simply take the total units sold and multiply it by how much each individual item costs. Now, of course, this is glazing over business costs, like how much it costs to get the raw materials and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but let's keep it simple. I'd like to just calculate how much income I made selling these items. Placing my cell in H4, what I'd like to do is calculate those values, units sold times price. So I'm going to actually need to write a formula this time. There's no automated tool for this. Now in Excel, we need to wake it up. We need to tell it that it's going to be doing some math. The way we do that is with the universal sign equals. By typing the equal sign, we've indicated to Excel that it's about to do some math and that it needs to wake up and start paying attention to the content coming afterwards. So now that I've typed H4, I'd like to go ahead and calculate total units sold times price. Now I could type 3263 and then the multiplication sign using my shift 8 key and then typing 4 and it calculates it. In this case here, I made $13,052. But here's the problem. Let's say I raise the price. Let's say that this was incorrectly added. And the actual price of a cup of coffee is $3.95. Did my subtotal change? No, it's still $13,052. The reason being is that we told Excel what to do, not where to look. Remember when I showed you the formula bar? If I click inside this cell right here, I can see that the formula isn't looking at this cell right here to see if it's changed. It still says 4. So how do we fix that? How do we future-proof a formula to account for data changing? Well, first things first, let's go ahead and delete that value in cell H4. And I'm going to start over with my equal sign. And this time, instead of telling Excel that it's going to be multiplying 3,263 by $3.95, I'm simply going to tell Excel where to look to find those numbers. So in this case here, it's going to be G4 selected by clicking on it. You'll notice that it's got the dancing ants all around it. Multiplied by B4. Once again, notice that it's got the little dancing ants around it. G4 times B4 inside of the cell where I'd like this answer to come out. And I'm going to lock it in by pressing and holding the control key and tapping enter. And there it is. So I made $12,888.85. And now if I change my coffee price back to $4, voila, my subtotal also changes. So now I can update this data with the latest information and... I'm able to see those numbers reflected in any formulas that are referencing those cells. Go ahead and pause the video and try this out for yourself. Once again, in cell H4, what we simply did was multiplied total units sold by clicking on that cell, multiplying it by the price. Once again, by clicking on that cell and pressing enter to lock it in. Go ahead and try that. All right. So now we've got the subtotals for all four items. And if I'd like to, I can actually even calculate the total dollar value of all the items together. 
Now we saw that we were able to do it with the auto sum feature, but let's talk a little bit about how they got that value and how we can build that function ourselves. To do that, what I'd like to do is build a sum function. Now just like with a formula, I'm going to start with my equal sign, but this time instead of just jumping right into the math, I'm going to tell Excel exactly what I'd like it to do. And in this case, I'd like it to sum up the values. So I'm going to type the word sum, and a couple of things pop up here. We see a list of functions, like sum, sum if, and for every cell that's selected here, or every function rather, you'll see off to the right a description of what this function actually does. And in this case, the sum function adds all the numbers in a range of cells. If that's the function you'd like to use, and it is, we'd like to tell Excel this is the one. We do that by inserting an open parentheses after the function's name. So I've got equals sum, open parentheses. I can now select all the numbers I'd like added into my sum function. In this case here, I've got 13,000 through 1,927. I selected all four values by clicking and dragging. However, you can also click and hold the shift key and tap the down arrow key until all the values are selected. Once that's in place, we'd like to tell Excel that this function is now complete, and the way we do that is by pressing and holding the shift key and closing off these parentheses. Remember, every open parentheses requires a closed parentheses as well. Once this function is done, I'm going to tap the enter key, and there you have it. Total, we made $24,038 in this particular month's worth of sales. Not bad. Maybe we'd also like to calculate the average number of units sold. So in this particular instance, maybe I'd like to find out the average number of coffee items sold. So let's go ahead and in cell C10 here. Average units. And I'd like to find out how much I sold in coffee, tea, bagels, and English muffins. Go ahead and resize here a little bit. So how do you calculate the average units sold for coffee? Well, just like we did with the sum function, we'd like to tell Excel to do a certain set of math. And the way we're going to do that is starting with the equal sign. So I've typed my equal sign. And this time, instead of typing sum, I'm going to go ahead and type average. Once I've done that, I'd like to tell Excel, yeah, this, this is the function I want to use. And I'm going to open up these parentheses. Now all I need to do is select the cells that I would like averaged together. In this case, I'm averaging coffee, so I'm going to select weeks one through four of coffee and close the parentheses. Tap enter to lock it in, and I can see that the average number of units of coffee sold in any one particular week is 815 units. And if I highlight this cell, I can see in the formula bar, there's that function that I built. Go ahead and pause the video and catch up to me here. Let's calculate the average units for all four items. All right, welcome back. So at this stage, we've calculated the average unit sales of each individual item. We've calculated the total units sold of each individual item. And using that information, we were able to calculate the subtotal dollar value, the actual amount of money we earned selling these items. So let's keep on keeping on with some of this math. What we'd like to do now is maybe calculate the total amount of taxes that we're going to need to set aside for federal and state and local taxes. To do that, we're going to need the help of our tax rate field up here at the top. Now here in San Francisco, our tax rate is about 8.75%. So we'll be using that value. If you'd like to substitute it for your local sales tax rate, you're more than welcome to. Here in column I, I've got a taxes field. Now to calculate taxes, I'm simply going to multiply the total items, total dollar value made by the tax rate. So in this case of coffee, $13,052 multiplied by 8.75% to get the total amount of taxes I need to pull out. So let's go ahead and do that. Once again, to start any function or formula, I'm gonna need to kick it off with an equal sign. 
and I'm going to go ahead and select cell H4 and multiply it by 8.75%. Enter to lock it in, and I can see that the total amount of taxes I need to set aside is $1,142. Now once I've built a formula, I really don't necessarily want to have to build it all over again. That seems tedious, and it feels like a lot of work for a software program that's touted as being the end-all be-all of doing math for me. So we don't actually have to retype this formula all over again. We do have access to something called the autofill handle. The autofill handle allows us to copy the same formulas over and over and over again, adjusting for relative cell references. So for example here, let's say that I'd like to replicate this formula of G4 times B4 here in cell H4. I'm going to go ahead and clear these values out right here. And while in this cell right here, it does say G4 times B4, what I'd need in each individual cell is the respective row value. So instead of G4 times B4 here, in the cell below, I would need G5 times B5, and G6 times B6, and so on. So let's see what happens. To engage the autofill handle, I'm going to need to find the little green box in the bottom right corner of my active cell. Hovering over it, you'll see that my fat white cross turns into a thin black cross. Hovering over it, you'll see that once I've got that thin black cross, I'm going to click and hold and drag down to fill the respective cells that I'd like to copy. Notice that the green box is expanding, although no values have appeared yet. Once I release, notice all of the cells' values auto-populate. So, it surely did. G5 times B5, G6 times B6, G7 times B7. Great. So let's go ahead and do the same thing with taxes. Once again, I'm going to hover over that little green box in the bottom right corner and click and drag and release. Whoa! That is not what you expected, is it? What went wrong? <laughs> well, a lot went wrong here. Let's go ahead and talk about it here. Now, here in cell H or I4, I see the formula is exactly what I built it out to be, H4 times H1, or the subtotal times the tax rate. Let's see what the cell below it says. H5, or the subtotal, times H2. H2 has nothing in it. Oh, I see. So just like in the formula before, when I autofilled down, G4 times B4 became G5 times B5, this formula's value also increased. When you autofill down row by row, the row value, in this case right here, 4 and 1, both increase by 1. This is called relative cell referencing. When you autofill down, it continues to reference those cells relatively based on the positioning of the cell formula. We do, however, have the ability to control that a little bit more so. By selecting the cell that we'd like to lock in, in this case here, what cell do we not want to change ever? H1. We don't want the tax rate to ever stop being H1. We, in fact, we want every single formula to reference their subtotal and then multiply it by H1. So to lock that in, we need to absolute reference this cell, meaning that we will always absolutely reference that one point in the spreadsheet. To do that, we're going to engage the F4 key. So by selecting H1, the cell I don't want to change, I'm going to tap my F4 key, and you'll see that now H1 is surrounded by dollar signs. Once you've done that, go ahead and lock it in by tapping the Enter key. And you'll see that the formula itself didn't change the result. It's still 1,142. But I fixed it, right? All the other cells should be good? Well, unfortunately not. Autofill is a one-time deal, meaning that if I go from cell to cell here, you'll see that they're still referencing H2, H3, and H4. If I would like to replicate this style of formatting to all the other cells, 
I'm going to need to autofill down again. So one last time, I'm going to select I4, now with an absolute referenced H1 cell. I'm going to autofill down. And there it is. So now, H4 times H1. And below that, H5 times the absolute referenced H1. The cell below it, H6 times the absolute reference cell of H1. So when you're trying to build a function or formula that is going to consistently reference the exact same cell every single time, no matter what, no matter how many times you autofill or copy and paste, you need to remember to absolute reference that cell using the F4 key. Go ahead and pause the video and catch up with me here. Remember how we got there. To calculate the tax rate, we multiplied subtotal by the tax rate. However, to allow for us to absolute reference and autofill down, we remembered to lock in cell H1 in that function. Go ahead and take this opportunity to do just that. Welcome back. So now that we've got our basic menu up and running, let's take a deeper look. Things look all right. We've got our weeks one through four sales, we've got total units sold, and the cool part about this entire process is that it's automated, meaning that as soon as we update any of these sales values from weeks one through four, our total units sold changes, our subtotal changes, our taxes change, our average units change, all because we told Excel how to do what we wanted it to do. Once we've gotten to this point here, maybe we'd like to expand. We're doing so well, we'd think we're gonna add a new menu item. But there doesn't really seem to be anywhere for me to add that. We've got coffee, tea, bagels, English muffins. Maybe I'd like to add a third drink. That'd be kind of silly for me to toss it underneath the total here. So I actually need a little bit of room. In order to create this room, I'm going to insert a new row. To insert a new row, go ahead and place your cursor anywhere below where you'd like to have your row inserted. In this case, I'd like to have a new blank row 6. So I'm going to place my cursor in row 6. Having placed my cursor there, I'm going to navigate up to the Home tab and find that Insert button. Go ahead and find that Insert button and select the Insert Sheet Rows. And just like that, you've got a brand new clean row. Now, we could have also simply right-clicked on the row number 6 and selected Insert as well. Both will do exactly what you want it to do. Go ahead and try that for yourself and then come back. All right, so we've got our new blank row. Our new coffee drink will be our new patent pending cough tea. All rights reserved. And our cough tea will be I don't know, let's say five dollars. We'll go ahead and make up some sales figures here. It's super popular. And you'll notice that as we're going through this process here, all of our totals are updating as well. I'll explain why in just a moment. Now you'll notice that our totals down here at the bottom updated. However, our total units sold, subtotal, and taxes did not. The reason being is that when you insert a row where there's an existing range of summation, in this case, we were already summing up these fields right here. When we inserted a row in the middle, we stretched out that range. So any formulas that we're referencing, say from C4 to C7, if we stretched that out, it would automatically grow to include that new C8. However, when we insert a new row, it does not copy formulas. So you'll notice that here in cell G5, we have a formula, H5, we have a formula, I5, we have a formula. Those will not copy when you insert rows, so it is important to keep that in mind. Fortunately, we have our autofill technique, or by highlighting both one row that does have the formula and one row that does not, using the keyboard shortcut Control D, we can bring that down. Once again, the way we did that was by selecting a cell that already had the formula in place that we'd like to copy, 
and then auto-filling down using that little green box in the bottom right corner of the cell. Now that we've done that, let's say we'd like to add a couple of columns in order to give ourselves some breathing room. I think I'd like to have maybe like, let's say three columns of space, just to kind of give myself some room. Maybe I'd like to have this field reserved for notes about the week or the month. To insert a column, it's just as easy as it was to insert a row. Simply place your cursor where you'd like there to be a new column. And then here in the insert tab, I'm sorry, in the Home tab, find that Insert dropdown and select Insert Sheet Columns this time. Now that works for just one column at a time. However, if you'd like multiple columns, let's say I'd like two additional columns inserted, highlight two columns, in this case column A and column B, right-click and select Insert. And you'll see now that two columns were inserted. Go ahead and try that for yourself and then come back. Fantastic. So we've dropped in a new row, we've inserted a new menu item, we gave ourselves three extra columns of space because we'd like to be able to take notes. But you'll notice that when we moved things over a little bit, we kind of lost the organization that we had set up here. For example, our title was initially supposed to be the first cell you saw. And I'm not necessarily in love with how far off to the right average units is now. So let's fix that. Now, there's two ways to move and copy data inside of Excel. The first way is relatively straightforward. Click to select the cell that you'd like to move, and then hovering over the border of that selected cell, click and hold, and then drag to the left, or to wherever you'd like to drop it off, and you'll notice that as I'm moving it, I have that green silhouette with no content in it yet. But as soon as I release, boom. Now let's do something different with average units. I'd like to move average units from here to, let's say, here. This time, instead of just highlighting and clicking and dragging, which would be the easiest way, I'm instead going to use my cut tool, which can be found here inside the Home tab. You can also use the keyboard shortcut Control X, as you can see in the parentheses of that tooltip that's popped up. Having cut the data, it's now highlighted with that flashing marquee. I'm now going to place my cursor where I'd like the first cell to paste. In this case here, this is the cell where I would like average units to be. Once I've got my cursor where I'd like, I can click the Paste button, or, as the status bar says, I can press Enter. Using either of those methods, I'll go ahead and paste the content. Go ahead and try that for yourself, and then come back. Fantastic. So now you've had a chance to see how easy it is to move, cut, and copy data without having to think about it too hard. Now, I'd like to go ahead and take this opportunity to create my notes section. This is where I'll take any notes on a week-by-week -week basis to keep an eye on fluctuations annotate whether or not there are reasons for fluctuations in the business, up or down. So first things first, I'm going to go ahead and just type out notes here. And what I'd like to do is just on a day-by-day -day basis, annotate what's going on throughout the week. So I'm going to start with Sunday here. Now I know what comes after Sunday, and hopefully all of you do too. So I don't necessarily want to have to go through this whole process of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I already know what comes after all of those days. Well, so does Excel. As it turns out, just in the same way that we're able to copy formulas like we did earlier, we're actually able to copy certain values inside of Excel just as easily. So I'm going to take my cursor over here, and I'm going to highlight Sunday. Now, with my active cell on Sunday, You'll notice that we've got this drop-down arrow, just like we did in every other instance. This little box in the bottom right corner, the autofill handle, I'm going to take my cursor and hover over it. Once again, make sure that your fat white cross becomes a thin black cross. Once I've got that thin black cross, I'm going to go ahead and click and hold, and I'm going to drag, and watch what happens. Look at the little tooltip on the right. It says, Monday. I drop down again 
Tuesday. It's actually autofilling the days of the week. Excel does know, just like you and I, that Sunday comes before Monday, comes before Tuesday, and so on, all the way through Saturday. So I've taken it down to row 10, and I'm going to release. And look at that. So we can use autofill not only to continue the pattern of formulas that we're using, but we can also use it to continue on annotating common knowledge fields. Well, what else can we autofill? How about something as simple as the date? Today's date I've currently got 2015. And of course, I know full well that after November 25th, we've got the 26th, 27th, and so on. But I really don't want to have to go through this whole process of typing. Well, once again, we've got autofill to the rescue. So I'm going to highlight the little cursor. And once I've got my fat white cross and I take it and turn it into that thin black cross, I'm going to click and hold. And I'm going to drag down and boom, look at that. The tooltip on the right hand side. 11 slash 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Now this is where you really have to ask yourself. One, is there a 31st day? And if there's not, does Excel know that? Boom. Look at that. I'm going to go ahead and release. Excel actually knew that there isn't a 31st day in November, and so it jumped straight to December 1st. Autofill can really save you a lot of time with just these little micro decisions, these little micro checks to see whether or not you're putting in the right information. Or if it's such common knowledge that it's beyond mundane, Autofill can alleviate the whole process and tedium of having to do something uh, that simple. Go ahead and take this opportunity to try this out for yourself. Go ahead and type a familiar common value, like Sunday, or better yet, maybe it's abbreviated value of sun, and autofill down and watch what happens. You can also use the months of the year, like January, or their abbreviation of Jan. It's pretty cool. Pause the video and take this opportunity to try it for yourself. We've got a pretty good looking worksheet here. If we wanted to, we could expand a couple of things here and there. But right now, the thing that's kind of driving me a little bit bonkers is the fact that it's not very visually striking. In fact, it's kind of difficult to read. So with that having been said, let's try and spice things up a little bit. Let's make this a little bit more user-friendly, should we say. Let's start with something simple. The title. Now, at first glance, you might not even know this is the title. So let's fix that. Now, what does a title look like? That can be a really difficult thing to determine. And in fact, it's a really tedious process to have to go through this time and time again when it comes to deciding what something should or shouldn't look like. So instead of having to make those design decisions yourself, let's let Excel do that for us. I'd like to introduce to you now the Cell Styles tool, which has a convenient series of prepackaged styles that you can apply to a cell, allowing you to take your hands off the wheel, so to speak, and allow Excel to change the visual aspect of cells for you. Once again, let's take the title. Here inside the Home tab, find that Cell Styles dropdown. And as you click on the dropdown, you'll see there's a number of different categories. We've got Good, Bad, and Neutral, Data and Model, Titles and Headings, and then we have our themed cell styles and number formatting. Now, where in this might I find a title? It's not like it's just going to be named something so convenient, right? Well, there you go. So let's go ahead and find that. Click and select cell A1 and then hover over title to get a live preview of what that will look like. Now, of course, you can get a live preview of what all of these titles and headings and cell styles will look like just by hovering over them. In this case here, however, we'd like a visual indication that this is the title. It's bigger. The font styling is a little different. I think this is good. Go ahead and find that title button and give it a click. And there you go. 
Without having to decide what a title should or shouldn't look like, we've allowed Excel to do that for us, leaving us to focus on something more important, like actually filling out the numbers and things to that effect. Let's take a look at the headings. Go ahead and highlight from D3 all the way down to L3 here are headers. I'd like some visual indication that these are the headers. So once again, I'm going to jump to my cell styles. Hmm, if only there were a headings style. Well, as it turns out, there are. Heading one, a little big. Heading two, getting there. I like heading three, something nondescript, low profile. And I'm going to lock it in with a click. You'll notice that we highlighted everything before we did it. In most instances in Excel, you won't have to, but there are some instances where you will have to. There's a saying we haven't learned, and it's you've got to select to effect. If you're changing the visual effects of a cell, you've got to select it first. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for our item names. From coffee down to English muffins, I'm going to go ahead and highlight those, and this time I'll use the cell style heading 4. So while it's all well and good that we're able to use these cell styles to change the visual aspect of things to make them look good, we can also use them from a functional standpoint as well. For example, the total row, indicating that these are totaled values, because if I'm just going down week one, I'm not going to have any real indication that this cell is any different than this cell. So let's fix that. Using cell styles, we're going to use the total styling which is going to highlight the total row using bold font styling and borders. Go ahead and find that and give it a click. All right, this is starting to come together. What other kind of functional changes can we implement here? Well, as I'm looking at this here, I know for a fact that these are cells that are going to change. These are cells that we're going to be inputting numbers into. So maybe we'd like to use some visual indication to ourselves and to other people using this, that these are input cells. Now where or where might I find a cell that indicates input? Oh, well there you go. So highlight all the cells that you'd like to impact. In this case, I'm highlighting all the sales fields from week one through four. And I'm gonna select the input styling. Now this might not mean anything officially, but if you continue to use the same naming scheme, the same styling scheme, you're going to know every single time you see this style of cell that this is a cell that requires input. Much in the same way that we might also highlight all these cells that have formulas in them and call them output cells. Go ahead and take this opportunity to spice up your worksheet a little bit here. Of course, you can use other cell styles other than the ones provided in the title and headings and data and model. In fact, maybe you'd like to use some themed cell styles that change and ebb and flow with the theme, which we'll be talking about in just a moment. But go ahead and let's limit ourselves to just these ones for now. We'll talk a little bit more so about good, bad, and neutral in just a little bit. Welcome back. So now we're starting to see that using cell styles, we're able to kind of hand off control and allow ourselves to focus on the really important things, like the numbers, the things we're actually putting inside the cells. You don't need to waste time thinking about how something should look. By simply allowing the cell styles to do what they do best, you can focus on what you do best. Now, what other benefits are there to using cell styles? Because I certainly could have just used the fill paint can well, there's a couple of different things that come into effect with cell styles. Obviously, we see that there are a couple of border changes that take place. In some instances, depending on styling, the font color and font styles change as well. But there's one other thing that comes into play here that's really important. And it's actually found here inside the page layout tab. A lot of people don't necessarily consider themes to be something that's relevant inside of Excel. In fact, many people don't even know that Excel has themes, but it does and you're in fact currently inside of a theme right now. Themes control everything from the default font styling to the default color scheme. They also control shape effects, but we don't see too much of that inside of Excel. 
So let's focus on the top two for now, colors and fonts. Themes are a combination of these two items. By clicking and dropping down the themes option here, you'll see a series of options. We're currently inside the office theme. But if I hover over some of these other tools, watch what happens. Wow. It's pretty incredible to see how the entire look and feel of this document changes simply by hovering over these tools. This live preview gives you an idea of what these will look like if we were to choose them. Notice that not only is the color scheme changing, but so too is the font. By surrendering a little bit of control and using cell styles, we allow ourselves to change the look and feel of a worksheet in a single click by changing the theme. Let's find a theme that works well for you. Personally, I like this Ion font theme. So I'm going to go ahead and find that and give it a click to lock it in. And just like that, this is a whole new worksheet now. It looks pretty good. Now, of course, I don't have to choose a theme. I can always build my own in a sense, simply by finding my own color scheme that I like and choosing my own combination of font styles. So let's say I like this color scheme, but I'm not in love with the font choices. I can always go to fonts and get a live preview of what some of these other options are available. In this case here, I think I like the default Cambria and Calibri. So I'm going to go ahead and choose just the standard office one at the very top here, Calibri Light for the headings and Calibri for the body. And I'm going to click to lock it in. And just like that, this is now my style. I like the color scheme, I like the font stylings, and if I want, I can even save the setup as my own custom theme. In fact, go ahead and do that. Find your own font combination and color scheme that you like, and then join me here in the dropdown where it says themes, and select save current theme. Now it's very important to note that where it's placing us right now, the document themes folder, don't navigate out of that. This is the only place Excel looks for custom themes. So don't save it to the desktop, don't go to my documents, stay inside the document themes folder. I'm gonna go ahead and change the file name to Sean's theme, something I'm gonna remember. And I'm gonna click save. And just like that, I've built my own custom theme. If I click on the drop down inside themes, check it out. There's my theme. Pretty cool. Go ahead and try that for yourself and then come back. Once again, what we did was we decided on our own personal color scheme and font combination that we liked for our workbook. Then clicking on the drop down arrow, we selected save current theme to save that combination. Go ahead and try that for yourself. Welcome back. This is starting to look pretty good. In fact, it looks so good that I might want to hold on to this and use it every month. Well, there's a couple of different things that I'd need to worry about if that were the case. For example, I would have to worry about overriding last month's sales data. Now, if I were to do this in the real world, of course, you would hope that I would go in and create another copy of this file before editing the data. But the reality is most of us are a little on the forgetful side when it comes to doing things like that. So let's take a look at some of the solutions that are available to us. First things first, I'm going to get rid of all the sales data that wouldn't be relevant in a new month. Now, one of the things you'll want to remember is that we've got formulas all over the place here. And as soon as new sales data gets put in, all of these sales fields are going to kick into high gear and we're going to get all the information we need. So pretty much everything that we need to worry about here needs to get cleared out. All right. So now that we've done that, how do we preserve this and make sure that every time we open it up, it opens just as fresh as it is right now? Well, in order to do something like that, we need to save it as a template. To save an item as a template, it's really just as easy as saving any other file. 
we're going to start off by going up to the File tab here in the top left. I'm going to go ahead and click File, Save As. And in this case here, I'm going to go ahead and save it to, let's say, My Documents. Now, as it stands, it's trying to save it as an Excel workbook. However, we're going to change that. Instead of saving it as an Excel workbook here, I'm going to find Excel Template. This is really important, and in fact, it's one of the most critical things you'll need to remember. Now, one thing you'll need to keep in mind here is check out what happened as soon as I changed it to an Excel template. It took me to a whole new folder that I hadn't even noticed. The Custom Office Templates folder. Don't navigate out of this. This is the only place that Microsoft Office looks for templates. So once again, do not leave the Custom Office Templates folder. If you don't get automatically taken to the Custom Office Templates folder, go ahead and take that opportunity to Google where that folder is. While it should work all the time, there are going to be occasions where it doesn't automatically do it, so you'll need to navigate there manually. Now, for most of us, this should have taken us right where we need to go, so I'm going to go ahead and name this Monthly Sales. And from here, all I got to do is click Save. Boom. And just like that, I've now created a template. Now, what do I need to do now? Well, first things first, you need to remember you're still inside the template after you've done that file save as. So we're going to close out of this by going to File and Close. Now, let's go ahead and open that template. I'm going to go to File, New. And I don't see my monthly sales template here. I see all the other templates we saw earlier, but no monthly sales. But you will notice that we have a new section available that wasn't there before, the personal section. This is where Microsoft is going to log all of your custom templates. So I'm going to go to personal, and there it is. There's my monthly sales template. I'm going to go ahead and open it up here. And at first, it looks exactly the same as everything we've done before, except all the fields are empty and I've got no dates and none of the formulas are kicking in. So what was the difference between this and what we just closed out? Well, take a look at the name of the file here. Monthly Sales 1. Weird. That's almost like it's using the exact same naming scheme it does when it opens a brand new Excel workbook. Workbook 1, Book 2, Book 3, and so on. So what's actually happened here is it's created a brand new copy of monthly sales. So let's say that I go ahead and fill out all the sales data here. Nothing too crazy. I'll just go ahead and give it a couple of numbers here. Looks like we had a good week 2. Week 3, maybe this is some sort of major sporting event or conferences in town. So I filled in all the sales data and we'll say that the notes are going to be for the week of 1131. If there is a 31. There is not, it doesn't look like it, so let's try that. There we go. All right. So now the concern would be, of course, that if I click save, it's going to overwrite my template. So normally you'd have to go do a file save as. But check out what happens if I click the save button now. It forces us into save as. You can't overwrite a template. And this is kind of the magic of templates. You can create this pristine, protected data set that every time you open up a new copy of, you start over. Nothing you can possibly do would overwrite this template unless you deliberately go and save over the template using the exact same methodology we used to create it. Not bad. Go ahead and pause the video and take this opportunity to try that out for yourself. Remember, clear out all of the data that would change. And then from there, once you've got everything in what we call boilerplate status, which means that all the data is generic and non-time specific or non-situation specific, go to File, Save As, and save it as an Excel template.
Go ahead and pause the video and take this opportunity to catch up. All right. So we've now talked about how we can save these custom templates in order to prevent ourselves from doing more work. Let's keep on that trend. Now, Birch and Daughter's Coffee Shop is doing phenomenally well. Just crazy sales, really great. So great, in fact, that we're actually gonna be opening up a new location. How great is that? To make a duplicate of this worksheet here, so that we can keep track of that new location sales, there are a couple of ways that we can do that. The first way is a little roundabout. By right-clicking on sheet one, the sheet that currently has this worksheet, you can select move or copy, and then select create a copy and click OK. But that was a lot of clicks. Let me show you an easier way. By pressing and holding the control key, click and drag sheet one to the right, and release. And you'll notice it instantly creates sheet one in parentheses two. And as I navigate from sheet to sheet here, you'll notice it is an exact duplicate in every single way. Now, of course, we're gonna have to rename these worksheets. So let's do that. I'm gonna right click and rename sheet one. This will be our San Francisco location. And our second sheet here will be our LA location. There you go. And of course, we can create additional copies on top of that once again by pressing and holding the control key and clicking and dragging to the right and releasing. And let's say we'll call this our New York location. We're doing pretty good here. Now, when we've got multiple worksheets like this here, one thing that's going to be a little bit problematic is the fact that now, if we want to make a change to this entire styling here, we have to go from sheet to sheet to sheet. At least that would be the impression that you might have. For example, let's say we'd like to change the price of tea from $3.50 down to $3. We found that sales just aren't quite what we hoped they would be, so let's drop down the price. Now, I don't wanna to have to go from SF to LA to NYC to change that single cell in all three. In fact, if I'm making any change like that, having to make that same change three times is mind numbing. Instead of going through that process, because these are all the same style of worksheet, I can actually group these together and make the change all at once. To select all the tabs in this workbook, simply right click on any one tab, or pressing and holding the control key, single click on all the unselected tabs, and you're gonna have all three selected at this stage here. Notice that they all have a visual indication of that green line underneath, showing us that they're all selected. Having selected all three sheets, I'm now gonna go to this cell, and I'm gonna change the price from 350 to $3. And I'll tap the enter key to lock it in. And what the heck, maybe I'll also change English muffins to crumpets. We really wanna bring up our tea sales. So maybe if we sell crumpets, that'll help. Now, I'm in the NYC tab here, but let's see if that made the change in LA and SF as well. Here's my LA tab, crumpets, $3. SF, crumpets, $3. NYC, crumpets, $3. By grouping our worksheets together, either by right-clicking and selecting Select All Sheets, or by pressing and holding the Control key and selecting all three worksheets, we were able to make one change and have it propagate across all the selected worksheets. Pretty cool. Go ahead and try that for yourself, and then come back. All right, so keep on keeping on. We're doing really well. We've got three locations, we've got a template that allows us to inject our sales data and calculate total units sold, our subtotal, our average, and so on. Great. Now that we've got a template and a worksheet that allow us to input the data, 
Let's talk about reading the data a little bit more so. Now for this, I'm gonna go ahead and just jazz up some sales data here. All right. So let's say I'd like to analyze week over week how we're doing in any one particular item. Now, when it comes down to analyzing sales data, there's a couple of different ways we can come at this. Now, this is a really small worksheet, so there's not a lot of problems reading it. But with that having been said, you're going to need to know how to navigate through that kind of sales data. For example, let's say I'd like to compare my items directly with week four. Now, as it stands, week four is significantly more separated from coffee. And even more so is my total units sold, subtotal, and taxes. In order to fix this, I'd like to be able to bring in, let's say, total units sold and subtotal all the way over here to compare with my items, instead of having to go from here to here, T all the way over. To do that, it would be nice if I could freeze everything off to the left here and scroll everything over here over. And as it turns out, here in the View tab, we have exactly that tool, Freeze Panes. Now, Freeze Panes has three options available. Freeze Panes, Freeze Top Row, and Freeze First Column. Freeze Top Row and Freeze First Column do exactly what they sound like they do. By clicking Freeze Top Row, I can now scroll down, and you'll see that the top row stays intact. To unfreeze, simply click the freeze panes drop down again and select unfreeze panes. Consequently, on the other side of things, freeze first column, same thing. By selecting freeze first column, it only freezes the first column. While both of those are great, in most cases, they only do a limited amount. If we need to freeze anything more than just the top row or the first column, we're going to need to turn to this last option, Freeze Panes. Now, Freeze Panes is important to understand how it works. It freezes all rows above a cursor and all columns to the left of it. Meaning that if I've got my cell here in column F and row 4, it's going to freeze all rows above row 4 and to the left of column F. So let's take a look and see what that does. I'm going to place my cursor here in row F4, and I'm going to freeze panes. As I scroll down, you'll see that it's frozen rows 1 through 3, all the rows directly above row 4. And if I scroll to the right, it is frozen A through E, all the columns to the left of column F. So now I can compare total units sold to my price to see if there's any correlation with these items. Or by unfreezing panes and placing my cursor here in cell E4, I'll freeze panes again and now I can control and compare the subtotal of each individual item. So I can see here that coffee sold 4,000, tea 7, cough tea 10,000. We're doing all right in cough tea. Freeze panes allows us to hold on to part of the document and navigate to where we need to be, and it's a fantastic tool when it comes down to review and compare. Go ahead and take this opportunity to practice for yourself. One thing I'd also like to point out before you do is let's say you don't want to freeze any rows at all. Simply place your cursor in the row one, meaning there are no rows above it to freeze. So what will it freeze? All the columns to the left and only that. So if I select freeze panes now and scroll down, no rows are frozen. However, all columns to the left of column E are. Consequently, on the other side of things, if you don't want any columns to be frozen, but you do want rows to be frozen, let's say I'll place my cursor here in column A, meaning no columns to the left can be frozen because there are no columns to the left. I'll select freeze panes again, 
And there you go. Rows one through three, the rows directly above my active cell are frozen. However, if I scroll to the right, no columns are frozen. So there you go. Go ahead and try that out for yourself, pause the video, and then come back. While freezing panes is a really useful tool, sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes there are so many different things that we need to compare that by freezing just one portion, we're still not getting the whole picture. For example, let's say I just don't need to see average units at all. In fact, maybe I don't need to see weeks one through four. Maybe, as the CEO in this hypothetical scenario, I only really care about what items are selling and how much am I making from them. Meaning that all this is superfluous. I don't need it. In fact, I really don't even need taxes. So what can I do? How can I hide all of that without having to impact the usability of this document? Well, I can use something called custom views, which means that I can create views that depending on the person viewing them, and their needs, I can change what is visible and what is not. Let's take a look. First things first, we're going to need to create a snapshot of this. To do that, let's find the custom views tool, which can be found here in the view tab. Go ahead and find that and give it a click. Now you'll see here that currently it's blank for now. However, what we're going to do at this stage is we're going to create a snapshot of this current view the exact way everything looks. Currently, no rows are hidden, no columns are hidden, nothing's changed. So I'm going to click Add here on the right, and I'm going to call this my original view. And I'm going to click OK. A little anticlimactic, nothing seems to have changed here, but what I've done is I've taken a copy of what the view layout of this is currently. Now, let's build this idealistic view. First things first, I don't need this average nonsense. So I'm going to highlight all the rows here, and I'm going to right click and select Hide. You can also, from the Home tab, find the Format dropdown, and inside Hide and Unhide, select Hide Rows. Personally, I like the right click myself, but to each their own. Next. I'm going to hide everything between items and subtotal. So that's columns E through J. Once again, having highlighted all of those, I'm going to right click and hide. And lastly, I don't need taxes. So I'm going to right click on that and select hide. And maybe I'd like to zoom in a little bit. So I'm going to zoom in, let's say, to about 160. I'm going to 160% zoom. And now I'm going to take a snapshot of this view. This will be the CEO view. What are my items? How much money did I make from them? So I'm going to click on Custom Views once again. And this time, I'm going to click Add again. And I'm going to call this the CEO view. And click OK. Now that I've done that, I'd like to get back to my original view. Here's the scary part with hiding rows and columns. It's easy to forget where and how many were hidden. And then on top of that, you've got to find where they were, and then you've got to find the exact border and right click, and it's so much. Instead, we can use custom views, select the original view, and click show to revert back to the original view. The exact zoom level and viewability, meaning no columns or rows were hidden, that we were when we originally started. Now, let's go ahead and build another custom view. Let's say I've got somebody who's specifically in charge of the beverage situation at Birch and Daughters, meaning they only really care about how many units we're selling in beverages. We're getting ready to order more drinks. So I'm going to hide all the rows that have anything to do with food, in this case, bagels and crumpets. I'm going to right click and select hide. 
Same deal, once again, I'm going to hide any columns that don't mean exactly what I need. So I'm going to right click on these first three columns and hide. I'm going to hide price. And I really don't care about individual weeks sold. I only really care about total units sold. So I'm going to right click and select hide. And now I've got items, total units sold, subtotal, and I really don't need taxes either. Or total, there you go. So now I've only got my beverage information here. In fact, let's get rid of average units too. Wow, we really hit a lot that time, didn't we? But if this is all I need out of that entire worksheet, why should I see anything else? Once again, I'm going to click Custom Views. I'm going to click Add. And I'm going to call this the Drink Order View. And just like last time, I'm going to click Custom Views, Original, and Show to get back to home. Now I've got two custom views, the CEO view, which brings me to the exact view that I need to see, items and how much money I'm making from them. And I've got my drink order view, which only shows me the item and how many I've sold, so I know how many more I need to order. And once I'm done with all those views, I can always go back to the original. That's custom views. Go ahead and try that for yourself and then come back. Welcome back. So now it's time to shift gears and talk about the final stages of presenting any worksheet or workbook that we've created. When it comes to presenting, there's a number of different ways we tend to share these files, but they all start with something that should be incredibly important. Making sure you spelled everything correctly. I mentioned it in the beginning, but I'll mention it again. Excel does not spell check in real time, meaning that anytime you're typing any word into any cell, even if you misspell it, it's not going to warn you the same way it would inside of Microsoft Word. We actually have to trigger it ourselves. Go ahead and find the review tab here at the top of the ribbon, and on the left hand side, you'll see the spell check tool. To trigger the spell check, simply click the button. Now, of course, you can also see as I hover over it, that the F7 key will also trigger spell check. So I'm going to give it a click here. And the first thing it finds is here, English muffins. Oops. But it gives me the appropriate suggestion. Did you mean English? Yes, I did. So I'm going to select change. Now, interesting. Notice it says, do you want to continue checking at the beginning of the sheet? You might not have noticed it before, but my cursor placement was right here. It should have caught coffee, shouldn't it have? However, because my cursor was below that value when I started the spell check, it started spell checking everything from here down. It didn't check anything above it. Fortunately, Excel does have the ability to check from the beginning of the sheet once it's checked everything else. So I'm going to go ahead and click yes. And now it catches coffee. Suggestions, coffee. I'm going to select change. And there I am. My spell check is now complete. Go ahead and spell check your own document and then come back. Now that we've spell checked the document, it's time to set things up for if we're going to print this document. Now print tools aren't necessarily exactly where you'd expect them to be. Many of us anticipate that when we go to File and Print, we'll see everything we need to see here. But that's not entirely accurate. In fact, we're going to need to make sure that we set some print settings ahead of time using the Page Setup section of our Page Layout tab. Now, you do have access to the Page Setup in a limited capacity from the Print Preview menu, but it's important to note that this is the only way to gain access to all the tools available is through this set process. So find page setup, and on the bottom right corner, you're going to see a little pop out button. Give that a click. And this is going to give you the full page setup view. This is where we can control the page orientation, whether we're printing in portrait or landscape. We can also dictate how it scales. 
Do we want it to be real size or do we want to fit it to a specific page? If we say fit to one page by one page, it will only fit this entire worksheet onto one page, no matter what, even if that means shrinking it down to an unreadable size. So do keep that in mind. Margins, of course, we can control the margins if we'd like to. If you need a little bit of extra space on the left for punching holes in to put into a binder, or maybe a little bit more at the top for notes, this is where you can input that there. Of course, throughout this entire process, by selecting Print Preview, you can get an idea of what this will look like. We also have access to headers and footers. If you'd like to put a date down at the bottom, maybe you'd like to put the location or name of the worksheet, the name of your company, how many pages there are. All these options are available inside the header and footer options. And lastly, the sheet, the most important part. Now, let's say for example, we don't necessarily want everything to be printed, we just want a select area. For example, let's say we only want to print the notes. Well, by clicking inside the print area, I can actually highlight just the notes field. And with that having been highlighted, I'm going to go ahead and click print preview and check it out. That's all that's being printed. This is called set print area. You can also find the print area button here in the page layout tab. To set the print area from here, simply click on the drop down, click clear print area to remove any existing print area fields. And let's say I'd like to print just this. I'll highlight all of it, set print area. And now by going to file print, you'll see only the selected area now is being printed. To clear your print area, simply click on the drop down and select clear print area once again. And now, if I'd like to do anything else more with this, let's say for example, I'd like to see what the page view will look like. I can go to the view tab and I can use any of these workbook views, either to view specific page breaks, meaning I'll see any individual page separation, in this case here, because I've got it set to fit to a single page, I'm only seeing page one. I can also see it in page layout. This is what many people consider to be actual print preview, because it actually shows the page as it will show when it prints. So there's a lot of control over what we can do here, but it all starts with knowing that these tools are available. Go ahead and take this opportunity to Try these options out for yourself. Remember, to set any of the page setup options, we're going to be inside Page Layout, where we can control the margins, orientation of the page, how big the page is. For my Excel veterans, if you prefer that pop-out box we were using, select that pop-out in the bottom right corner of the Page Setup command group, and you'll get the full set of options available. Go ahead and try that for yourself, and then come back.